Are you new to investing? Wondering whether or not you can self-manage your properties? Let us tell you about our partner, Rent Ready. Rent Ready is an awesome property management software that can help you grow and handle every aspect of your real estate investing business. Rent collection, tenant screening, maintenance, lease signing, listing. Honestly, Rent Ready has everything. One of the best features is their new tenant software, Latchel, where you're able to remove yourself as the landlord from being the middleman between tenants and maintenance calls. And it's also essentially a fraction of the cost of what you would pay for property management. Let me also mention that Rent Ready is unlimited. All their plans are flat priced. This means you can keep adding properties to your portfolio without having to pay more. You can close on all the properties you want and Rent Ready's price stays the same. Best part about it is for you guys is they've given us an amazing deal to pass on to all Weekly Juice listeners. You can get 50% off any Rent Ready plan at rentready.com when you use our code JUICEPOD. That's rentready.com, R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com with code JUICEPOD, J-U-I-C-E-P-O-D, and you'll get 50% off any plan. If this is your first time here, welcome. During our shows, we interview successful entrepreneurs and investors to spread knowledge, advice, and actionable tactics to help others in the pursuit of financial freedom. We discuss successes, failures, systems, motivations, experiences, and key lessons learned along the way in the hopes that these stories help you along your journey. Tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice. If you've been here before and like what you've been hearing, please subscribe, share with friends, rate and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes an extremely long way for us. It's simple. Just click on your podcast app, type in our podcast name, The Weekly Juice, click on the reviews and let us know what you think. The more ratings we get, the more eyes we'll get on our show and in turn, we'll be able to provide you all with high quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod for daily content and personal finance tips to assist in your journey towards financial freedom. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we have on special guest, Strap Brown. He is a real estate investor, wholesaler, and overall entrepreneur who created his own call center to essentially run a wholesaling business. Um, he's found a, a perfect niche in the, the real estate game here. He's looking to potentially invest in um, self-storage self storage down the line and just he has a great story talking about how he, he nearly made it to the NFL and, and had to make a pivot point in his life um, and learn essentially what many people, many athletes go through and like, did they have a plan B? And thankfully he did. And he, he hit the ground running and um, talks about going on door to door sales appointments with his son in the stroller. Like the guy's a grinder. He's a hustler. And it was just an awesome episode. Drop out of college to make you know, now from a dropout of college to make a hundred thousand dollars a month in his wholesaling business. And he talks about just being more than an athlete. I think a lot of these guys that or 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 women who are professional athletes that they are labeled as, as just athletes and he, his plan B overtook his plan A. And that's the really cool story about this is that he just had this unmatched perseverance. You'll listen to him. He's very like matter of fact, laid back. And he just figured out his niche. And his niche is doing pretty well. So I love it, man. Yeah. Hell of an episode. Um, I think we should uh, welcome in Strat Brown. Let's do it. All right, Strat, welcome to the show. We are thrilled to have you on. Um, I think you have a wealth of knowledge to bring to our listeners. So if you could just give people a little background on yourself, who you are, where you're from, and then how you got into essentially how you became an entrepreneur. Um, my name is Stratton Brown. I'm from a small town in Utah called Bluffdale, Utah. I grew up being able to like, ride horses up into the hills as a kid, like only a stoplight, only black kid for miles. Um, just living my life. And then growing up, I'd say a recurring theme for me has been, what's it called? My parents trying to let me down easy. I remember when I was eight years old and my dad's like, Hey man, you're not going to make the 18 for football. Right? He's like, you're not going to do it. And I go and I do it. And I was like, yeah, fuck you, dad. Right. Like not saying that, but like, and then like having that chip on my shoulder and back, no, I went and did it. Dad. like, you, you can't tell me what to do. And then that's, I guess has been a recurring theme throughout my life. And what really is like driven me into entrepreneurship and like real estate and everything else coming out of high school, I had zero offers. I go to a junior college. I know I was going to ball out. I get offers from like five different schools. I choose Fresno state over Utah because my classes, I was taking like a first aid class. What else? 
an art class, like just nonsense classes. And Utah's a really, very good educational school. It's like, bro, you got to take some real classes before you come here. So you got to wait another semester. And then Fresno State calls me. They're like, oh, yeah. I go, you take art? Cool. And they were ranked 15th in the country. And I was like, oh, hell yeah, let's do it. And so I end up going there for uh, at Fresno State. I was, I didn't even play really until my senior year. My junior year, I was injured a lot. My senior year, I'm 17th in the country in tackles, all conference. I, what's it called? Get a sports hernia to where all, like my abs tear off my pelvis, hamstrings. It's the worst thing ever, bro. And I messed up my neck pretty bad. I go to the Seahawks and um, I'm there and I, they drafted four other DBs. One of them became a pro bowler, Shaq. And what yeah. a, Shaq became like a pro bowler, pro bowler. And then they drafted a kid named Delano Hill. I don't know if you guys know who he is. And then two other dudes. I was playing the same position as Delano Hill. And I legitimately remember like sitting there thinking, and, and I talked to my D coordinator and I'll go back to that. But I was sitting there thinking, I was like, bro, I cannot do physically what this kid can do. I am 6'1", 200 pounds. This kid was 6'3", 230 pounds. They could put him in the nickel in the slot and he ran a 4'3", and I ran like a 4'6", and I was like recovering from surgery. And so they're like, long story short, end of the day, they're like, hey, Strat, like you're, you're not fast enough, bro. And so I really like sat down and I was just like, what am I, do I want to work my ass off to get another chance at something or do I want to actually like make a career out of something? And my senior year, I'm partying my absolute fucking ass off, right? Just partying. Think about Mike, Michael Irvin. Like I'm just going hard, living life. All I do is watch film, party, watch film, party, go to school. And um, I get into books and like real estate books because I think about I'm sitting here thinking to myself like Stratton, if you keep going this hard and you go to the NFL, you're going to go dead broke, son. Like you're going to go dead broke. And so I start listening to like bigger pockets, listening to Grant Cardone, Dave Ramsey, who else? And Rich Dad Poor Dad. So I'm taking in all this, all that info before I even get to the Seahawks, just because I think I'm going to be so filthy rich. Cause you can't tell a senior, a single senior in high school that they're not going to make it to college. And you're not going to tell a scene, a single senior in college that they're not going to make it to the league, NBA, NFL, whatever it is. Like it's, and if you don't think you're going to get there, then you're doing yourself a disservice because that's what you need to think at that high level. Yep, absolutely. So I'm there, bro. It doesn't work out. I have a talk with my coach my senior year. He put out Jadavian Clowney. He has 11 first-round draft picks at DB, and I played safety. And so he was like, Strat, you'll be like a practice squad, a special teams guy. And he was a really good like father figure to me. And this is the only time I didn't take it and be like, fuck you. Like, I'm going to do this. Because I really sat him down. I'm like, what, what am I going to do with my life, man? And he'd like, he, what's it called? He's put out like guys, guys, at DB. He coached Javion Clowney too. So like, I knew he had my best interest at heart. And he that's was telling when, it to you straight. Yeah. To where, and it's not, I remember in college, what's it, my sophomore year, my coach told me I had too big of goals. I, deep, I was like, I want to win the fucking Jim Thorpe this year. And he told me I had too big of goals. And again, that goes into like, nah, fuck you. Like, I'm going to do this shit, right? Mm -hmm. To where eventually like, I'm going to be all conference, do all those other things. But for whatever reason, I didn't take it that way. And so I come home from the Seahawks at this point in time, my girlfriend's pregnant and um, I'm going to all these real estate meetups, just trying to learn more. And I end up meeting my good friend who I worked for for a while. And he was like, uh, three years ago, I was driving a tractor making 20 grand a month. Now I'm making $200,000 plus a month. And he's like, I got checks too. I'll show you him. And he pulls out his phone and starts scrolling and showing me all these checks. He's like, I want to get a fucking jet. I was like, Oh wow. Like who is this guy? And like, he's like short, like five, eight, like buff guy. And I was like, who is this guy? I've never met anybody like him who thinks like him or anything. And so I don't even think twice about it. I go and I start a home inspection business thinking I'm going to be awesome. I'm like, Oh yeah, bro. I'm gonna make a hundred K a year. And there's nothing wrong with making a hundred thousand dollars a year, but I thought I was gonna make a hundred thousand dollars a year and be filthy rich. I go and do one home inspection and it was, disastrous. I hated it. I was in the crawl space thinking I'm gonna get bit by snakes and shit, bro. It was awful. <laughs> so I go do that. And then I call the guy and I'm like, Hey bro, like, what do you do again? And he's like, Oh, I flip houses and I wholesale. And he tells me, go get this app called property radar and go door knock all of the pre foreclosures until someone tells you they want to sell their house and call me. 
And this is a guy that you met at a meetup. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, this is a guy I met at a meetup. Wow. So this is your entryway into real and estate that, investing. That's my entryway into real estate investing. And then there's more. But yeah, that's essentially how I got got my foot into the door as I went and door knocked from dusk till dawn so much that my pregnant girlfriend thought I was cheating on her. <laughs> cheating on her with, uh, you know, houses. But that's funny, man. So, so you... All right. So like what's next, I guess. So you get this entryway in You're you're knocking on doors, which is not the fun stuff. You know, there's nothing glamorous about that. Do you have some success doing that? That parlays into the next kind of phase for you in real estate. What's what, what did you do next? So from there I knock on doors. Um, I have the baby. My son's mom has her own stuff that she's dealing with. So it, essentially it's me and my son a lot. It comes to the point where I'm taking my son door knocking with me and I'm still going to college. And then we didn't have daycare. She's from Baltimore. I'm from Bluffdale, Utah. I had no family out there. And so it came to a point to where I'm working for this guy now. And he was like, yeah, bring your baby. And I remember like walking, like pushing my stroller with my son or driving around with my son. So my son would stay quiet and I could make phone calls in the car and cold call using like Mojo on the go. And I could take my baby to work, but I couldn't take my baby to school. I got a job in, like, I already had a job at an investment company. I was like, bro, like, what else do I want to do with college? I'm going to fuck, like, communications. What are you going to do with that shit? I don't know what you guys' degrees are in. But for me, I had zero life skills anyways. Like, I'd, all I'd done was played football. Excuse me. So, like, I was like, yeah. So, I dropped out of college. And I just started working for the dude full time. And then eventually, we built out, like, a little in-house call center. We're doing a couple deals. We'd start doing a lot of deals and everything else. And eventually I just broke off on my own. It's really cool. Really cool. So just to give, I guess, a recap on everything, you had all intentions of going pro to the NFL, right? And you just, you weren't taking no for an answer. You, you grinded your way there. And then due to injury, which happens for a lot of people, right? You kind of hit an impasse and you're like, wow, is this something that I can see myself doing for the rest of my, for not the rest of my life, but like, am I going to make it right? There's a couple guys ahead of me stacked up bigger than me. Like, is the risk worth taking for, to have make X amount of money for this limited amount of time, if you do make it, or do if I start do move myself into self-education and teach myself, Hey, like you have to have a plan B. And it sounds like you, you know, you took plan B and you said, you just started educating yourself, you your plan reading, a. studying, and you made it your plan A and for your family. And then you, you grind it out, start, you met, you went to a real estate meetup at, based on your research, met a guy, started working for him in wholesaling. And I guess he does flips as well. And then you got into the call center thing with his, which is essentially right. Like you're, you're finding leads for him essentially for wholesaling. Is that, is that what oh, I'm getting? Bro. At? Yeah. So like, this is our company that I worked for him. We like, hired on a bunch of crazy ass people and threw them in our office. And like, we're just telling them to go make cold calls. Like, hey, go get us leads. To, to bring you leads to, to yes. get a wholesale deal. Is that the yes. deal? <laughs> of, and this is like minimum wage in the state of California of just complete wackos who we're bringing in there. And like, hopefully they stick. It was, so, it was exciting. <laughs> this is great. So let's just talk about like wholesaling in general then. So just frame it for people. Cause we were saying before the show, I think you're the first who is at least we'll talk in depth about wholesaling. We've had some people yeah. that have touched on it, but so maybe just give your ex explanation of what wholesaling is and then what exactly the people who you hired in the call center did and what their goals were like, what they were looking for in what to find a good deal for you guys. Um, and so to me, wholesaling is just an exit. Like it's just an exit strategy. There's people who wholesale commercial property for a million dollars a pop. Like all it is, is an exit strategy. So essentially it is, I would want to say at its core, the art of finding good deals. Like how are you going? It's a sales and marketing business. It's not even real estate. I truly do not think wholesaling is a real estate business. You're not holding any property. It's super transactional. Right, like your widget is real estate, but honestly, you're a sales and marketing. You can business. wholesale you're spending, at, almost anything. Is what, right, everything is wholesale at some level. So that's yeah, business. Like business is just wholesale. Like you're buying something at a lower price, and then you're upselling it, and there you go. So I'd say you're marketing to motivated sellers who want to sell their property at a discount, so you can make money off of that and either sell it to a flipper or sell it to a buy and hold person or take it down yourself. Wholesaling is just the exit of it. Cool. So can you walk us through essentially what you look for in a good deal, like a good wholesale deal? And then 
um, I know it's going to vary in different parts of the country, right? But like what potentially you could make on this and just like the process that you go through, like I'm thinking, okay, your, your, um, your rep will call them brings you a lead. Like how does, what's the next step of the game? Do you get on the phone and talk with them and like link it up and just make, go through the deal? Like we'll yeah. walk us through step by step. So when we're looking for a wholesale deal, we want, and then shout out Brent Daniels. He's like the father, they call him TTP, right? This yep, is I've heard of him. where yep. I got all this, right? So what's their price? What's their timeline? What's the property condition and what's their motivation? Their motivation is the number one, right? Do they have a legitimate motivation to like sell you something? If they're just saying, oh yeah, give me an offer, then odds are they're not serious about doing business with you. What's their timeline? Like, do they want to do business with you in the next 90 days? Or are they saying, oh yeah, I'll sell whenever. Because that time I have to say like, yeah, I'd really like to sell in the next 30 days or I'd like to sell sooner than later. Then that goes into that motivation factor. And it's no different than other sales, right? And then the property condition is a really big one. Obviously we'll make more money if they want to sell a $300,000 house. It needs like five grand in repairs, but they want to sell it for 150 because of some crazy motivation. Cool. I mean, but we're going to make a lot of money with that price, timeline, motivation, property condition. I covered all of them, right? Property condition. Yeah. Cool. Now I think it's very interesting, this business. And like, I think there's a misconception with it that it's not like scummy, but people think that you're like getting over on people by doing this. At least that's what I've heard. I know that to not be true, but what I find is really interesting is that, 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 that motivation that you talk about, you are actually solving a big problem for these people. And uh, most oh, yeah. of the time, like for, I, I know, for example, I've heard of a wholesale store, a wholesale story where maybe there was a house that, that had a lot of problems and the person who was living there just didn't want to deal with it anymore. And they, all they wanted to do was get out from under the property and sell it for what they had left in the mortgage. And what they had left in the mortgage was like 90 grand, but the market value for the property was like $300,000. So somebody like you can enter into that scenario and say, 90 grand. I mean, that's a done deal. We'll get this off your hands and you're solving the problem for them. And then you're making all this money on the deal like that. What's the, yeah. What's the fee called that you would charge as the wholesaler? It's an assignment fee. And in order to not think it's scummy, there's going to be a flipper who does the same direct mail marketing and he's going to negotiate the same deal. Right. Regardless, the market is going to tell them what they're going to get for their house. And the people pay you pretty much a convenience fee to deliver a, like a deal on a platter. And then the flippers who get smart and be like, I'm tired of paying all these assignment fees, go start their own lead generation business or do it in house. And then they're going to negotiate at the same rate that you do anyways. I right. So the it. seller is only going to get that amount anyways, if you are a good negotiator. And obviously like if someone, there's been instances where someone says like, I'll, I'll only take this amount. Like, Hey, no, it's like, we'll bump that up a little bit. Like you don't want to pull one over on someone. And if you're dealing with old people, we don't ever do business with old people unless we have their, all their children involved, right? Like ethical sure. shit like that. Yeah. But I mean, if you think it's slimy, then you don't know the other people out there marketing who are going to buy to that price anyways, you know? Hmm. Corey and I both are in the sales industry for our nine fives just, and I, it's funny to me, I've done about eight years in, in sales and, and retention and I have brought up to Corey a couple of times. I'm like, dude, we might want to consider wholesaling or just look into it a little bit more. And like, we're really all in on buy and hold right now. But for me, I think Corey's really good at running numbers. And I know he can find properties that if we don't have the cash right now, he can, he can, we can, we together can easily sell this to someone that's going to want to buy it. And we can make that convenience fee or, or um, consult fee. I forget what you called it, but um, assignment. Assignment fee. Thank you. There's other people that are listening are in the same boat they're in sales and they're doing something on their, in their regular nine to five, and they may have some time to do this. Can you sell us on why someone should become a wholesaler and what it can bring to their life? I mean, do I make more money? <laughs> How much are you talking? <laughs> yeah. so I was going to ask you, what's a good deal? Like what? You um, know, I mean, I'm it sure varies market some... to market, man. Say that again. Um, what's a, it varies market to market, but you're in Philly, right? Yeah. In Philly. I mean, there's some really, really nice neighborhoods in Philly where if you buy an old one, like you can have a 50 K pot pretty easily, right? Like that's not an issue. And you're already, the hardest part about the wholesaling is the sales. So all you're doing is just, again, operating in a different widget than what you're currently doing. Like you're already good at what you do, obviously. Now I'm going to take that skill set and I'm just going to pivot it. Now we're selling someone on something else and you can make more money. 
Okay. What is the actual, like the process, right? Like, are you getting these properties under contract and then just giving that contract to somebody else essentially for a higher price? Like, yeah. What's, I mean, it, okay. it's done through escrow and everything else, but essentially like we get a deal and like, Hey, um, what's going on, Dean? I got this deal. I don't want it. You want it? You want it for 200 and I bought it at 180. Yeah, that's fine. I'll take it. It takes wow. 20 K. You're good. Like you did all that front end work and obviously just like, it's not super simple. Like all the YouTube makes it seem, but you guys already have a network. You guys know how to negotiate. You guys know how to sell. So, okay. Yeah. And you guys know how to evaluate deals. So you're not going to lock up shitty deals, but you know what I'm saying? So you have all of the workings in your head already. You just have to go put it all together. Let's talk about how these call centers function for you. Like, are they, they're clearly the door openers, Strat, do you serve as the door as the door closer? Like, are you the one who evaluates these deals and then you're going to talk into sellers and closing it? And like, how many calls do these pe- do these uh, people that work for you have to make in order to get the lead in order to get to closing? Like, what's the funnel look like in your in your scenario? So I don't do. I only talk to like our storage sales. I don't do any wholesale sales anymore. Got it. But generally, what it looks like, all our people make about a thousand phone calls a day. And off of a thousand phone calls a day, you'll get one to three leads and varying from market to market. Day. That is a ton of calls. Hold up a thousand calls a day per person or a hundred calls a day. And you have 10 people. So you have a thousand calls a day. You'll talk to a hundred people. Right. So it's like, it's an auto dialer That's just pounding through stuff. Okay. Is it, is, is that a human being calling? Like, you no, so like you, you have like a calls? software that is doing the dialing. And then as soon as someone picks up, it connects us with our people, people talk to them. And then it's like, okay, this person is interested. They're not, they're not interested. Cool. On to the next. And it'll start dialing again. That's amazing. That's exactly uh, what okay. we wanted to hear. That, yeah. yeah. I was about to say, there's no human. I've made cold calls and I could max out at a buck 50 dude. And that's right, cranking. Like a, and that's cranking. These that's auto dialers are really nice. All day till 8 PM. 8 to 8. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that's, um, that's insane. That is not for me. Like, <laughs> but but the thing is that the cool thing about this is that like you're hiring people that like, uh, you, there may be some argument to me that they don't want to do this, but either way, like there's people that don't hate doing it or they are in a situation where they need to do it. And it's like, people will do this. You don't have to be the cold caller and you don't have to be the one doing, you know, physically knocking on doors like you did to get started. But I bet you doing that, the knocking on the doors to get started at least helped you learn the game enough to know, Oh, this is what works and this is what doesn't work. So that's, it's cool to, to For, come from humble beginnings, right? You have to go through that. Like you're not going to, you're not going to run a sales team or be able to operate in and run and, and own a call center. If you haven't been through the mud, right? Like, and gone through it. Exactly. Every single day. I don't think you guys should ever even hire on a call center until you've at least cold called yourself. And that way you can be like, all right, motherfucker, why aren't you doing your job? You know what I'm saying? To where like you've been through it and then you can go hold a company's feet to the fire and employees feet to the fire of saying, Hey, I know what our results need to be. I know what our expectations are. Why are they not being met? And at least you can look at it from a bird's eye view and like, okay, what's going on here? Or you can go dig deeper into it because we have people come to us all the time who are just getting started. And like, if they don't have a sales background and they haven't done a lot of direct to sell, I tell them like, Hey, go experiment with some VAs, see what you like, see what you don't like, see if you can figure it out. And then from there, come to a company. So I'm thinking about your employees, right? Where if you don't mind sharing, I'm just wondering like how much guys like this get paid. Is it based on like a salary plus commission um, based on how many deals they do? You can round about if you don't want to go exact. Um, I won't go into exact um, base numbers. Right. But uh, what's it called? They get a salary and then they get paid commission. But we, all my employees, I think we're in six different countries. So we are around the world to where we can get the price per lead down significantly. Right. If I have yep. to pay someone $13 an hour in California, that's not going to work out. If I have to pay them $13 an hour and I want to make my spread of, let's say 30 to 40% margin, just based off of everything else, you're getting charged 20 something dollars an hour. Then your cost per lead is through the roof. And for cold calling, you aren't getting really, really, really hot leads. You're just getting a lot of leads. So you're going to work with and building up that pipeline. Makes sense. So, and that's what, that's what we've heard that there's, you know, you can hire call centers out to countries all around the world and, and yeah. they're relatively cheap compared to what you would charge, especially in California. So it's, it's just interesting to know that I think when people think that they're like, well, these people speak English all over the world. Like that's what this is, right? Exactly. Yeah. 
So, you know, we talked at a high level on, on call centers, right? And this is like someone coming in and going to work for a company, but like, how can someone do this while still having a nine to five or like on the side, right? Cause that's like probably a lot of our listeners that are like, Hey, listen, like I'm comfortable making a decent salary. I want to like try this out, you know, and, and like mix it in with my real estate investing. Is that even a possible or something you'd recommend? Um, and you know, obviously it'll probably be more lucrative, the more leads you're pumping out to, and the more you time and effort you can put to it, but still something I think the try. question would be like, can you wholesale as a side hustle? Right. Um, so I hate the word side hustle because I feel like in people's brains, they don't treat it like a business. You know what I'm Fair. saying? Yeah. I mean, and you can, I would just say, if you're going to do it part-time, I don't like, we legitimately turn away people who haven't done it before. Like I said, so I'd say go cold call yourself first, see what it's like. And then that way, again, you can tell the company, I'm not happy because your people are saying this, this, and this as to compared to, let's say you go with the wrong company. I've done this before. And you're just like, Hey, where are all my leads? Like what's going on here? Like I've been paying you guys money for X amount of months. And I only have X amount of leads to where like that way. Like you're educated and you feel comfortable and you can know what the business is doing, right. What the business is doing wrong. And then I'd say, like, go do it for a month, cold call, go hire a couple of VAs. Like, okay, this is what it looks like. I trained them up. Here's what's going. Either you li- and you might like it. You might like might like managing them, or you might like cold calling on your own. I doubt it. And then from there, then I'd go to hire a company. It's interesting. I like your style. You're very matter of fact, but you're also laid back about the approach to it. And I want to I want to talk about like how this actually functions for you and what it generates for you. So you have you're finding deals. It takes you X amount of deal, X amount of calls to get to a lead, to get to a deal. What does this end up closing for you in a yearly time frame? I know you said you're about to be a year into this process. What does this generate for you? And like, what's your average wholesale deal that you bring in? So wholesaling wise, it's their average assignment fees, like $20,000. And like, I'll, I'll do one to three deals a month. Like not a lot. Some deals will do five, but I'd say on average, like probably two, three nothing big, right? I don't need tons of money. And then I talked to you about it before to where I'm not in a rush to scale a business that I can't sell, but I will make things really efficient to where it's like a cash machine for me. And I can go and take that money and reinvest it into actual real estate or find really good deals. Yeah. Perfect. Let's talk about your real estate investment portfolio as, so it sounds like you got started in the wholesaling and then maybe had this not switch over, but like you, you decided like, I need to create even more passivity for me. So what did you, what have you done? What does your real estate investment buy and hold portfolio look like now? And what have you done in the past um, couple of years to create that for yourself? So last year we bought three houses subject to, and subject to is just a, you buy the mortgage and then you transfer the deed over of the house over to yourself. You have the mortgage in the homeowner's name. So we bought three of those last year. And then we sold them two of them on wraps and one of them on a lease option. Can you dive in a little bit further and explain how those work? Oh boy. Let's see. Maybe like a (laughs) top, top line overview of how they work. (laughs) My girlfriend gets mad at me because like I've tried to explain a wrap multiple times and it's kind of a different one to think about. So we have our first mortgage or our underlying mortgage. So the first mortgage that the homeowner actually has. I will go and I already own the actual deed to the property. And so I will go find someone else who wants to, what's it called? Let's say my monthly mortgage payments are a thousand dollars. I can find someone who wants to give me $1,500 a month. So I'll collect that $500 spread. And then my, what's it called? The loan amount is probably 180,000 and I'm going to go and I'm going to sell it for 280. So I'm going to gain, I'm going to create a hundred thousand dollars in equity with that. Wow. And so that's what a wrap is. But are they living in the property? Like, I don't. Yeah. So they all deed over the property to them. In some States you can do contract for deed to where with contract for deed, they don't get rights to like the tax benefits and everything else in their state. Got it. And you still get to keep it you get the cash flow and everything else and you don't have to worry about any of the maintenance or anything like that because they're treating like their house now. So it's, it's powerful, right? Wow. It's super powerful. How does one even find like a deal like, like that? Or seller like- financing in a way. Am I, am I, yeah. Am it's, I it's another form of seller financing. Okay. Got it. That's what well, that's I seller finance the house to people. 
Like I, I am seller financing the house to people. Cool. And then like, how would you find someone that would be willing to do that? Um, pre foreclosures are an amazing way to do it. Obviously with everything that's going on, like pre foreclosures are completely shut down. And that's why I haven't really gone at that acquisition method a lot lately because I was like, there's not really a lot of motivation and everybody has too much equity to even want to do that. Right. Cause generally the home, will, there will, just won't be enough equity in the house to do anything with it. And so you'll buy it sub two. Right. Got so it. let's say I can, if I'm going to buy it and it's worth 180 cash and they're like, well, I won't make any money. I'm like, okay, well I'll buy it sub two and I'll give you 10 K cash. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that? I don't know. No, I'm making, <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm a little I'll... confused on that, but yeah, I, I think, uh, it's like a whole new, it's just a whole new layer of, of the buy and hold seller financing process. I mean, we, we understand the world of seller financing, but it's just like very interesting. It's a whole new layer. It just shows there's so many different ways to get into the game. And like, you would never know specifically you were, uh, I guess a seller financer or, you know what I mean? Like in yeah. you have three properties, like whatever, like I think we talked to so many different investors and they're like, yeah, I'm in buy and hold and you just expect them to be Okay. They just they're either buying the it in cash yeah. or, and they're renting it out or they're, they're taking out a typical Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac or conventional loan. And yep. I think the money is actually really in the niches. And that's maybe what your story is about here. Like in a, in a, in a, in a way, your money that you're making is in the niches and not doing things the like super conventional way. So I, I really like that. I, I love it. I mean, it was all no money down. And we made a ton of money off of it. So it's, it's powerful, right? It's not like Burr to where you can pull a bunch of your money out, but you can still do some creative things. with. What are your future goals with real estate, right? Like you got your three properties. Now you have the call center. What do you anticipate buying in the same style of property, same niche or um, potentially move into some other, like maybe larger multifamily, et cetera. So from these three properties, I've discovered that I fucking hate tenants. I want anything. Ah, to do with them. Yeah. I, yeah, I hate them. Yeah, I hate them. I don't I, want anything man, to do with them. I shouldn't say that I don't hate them, but it's it it it's, it's one of the things that grinds job. my it's, it's one of the things job. that grinds my gears for sure. Right. So. It grinds my gears. <laughs> yeah, it does. It really like I, I don't because maybe, my, way to put maybe it. my tenants are listening. You know what I mean? I don't hate them. They're good people. It's just like whoa, I don't want to deal. With it. I don't. I don't. So you fucking hate them, but that's cool. <laughs> uh, Self storage is what I'm actively looking for now and marketing to, to where I was like, okay, it's cash flow. It's bigger. Like you're playing with more zeros. So you'll make more zeros and there's no tenants, toilets or anything. It's really just people shit that they don't really know what to do with. They go put it in there. Yeah. That's a, it's really cool that you brought this up because I have a, a property that I have a duplex on and it's a huge lot, it's all this grass right now. I mean, I'm, I pay, I'm thinking about this. I'm pay for somebody to cut the lawn twice a month in the summer. Right. And then I'm looking at the space and I'm like, I can put like a five bay, six bay garage on the space and have people rent out the storage. And I, I ran the numbers on this and this is what self got me started thinking on self storage. We want, we're going through the permitting process already and it's like 40 or $50,000 to build this place. Let's say I didn't feel like putting all cash down and I wanted to do $10,000 down. Cause I think you can do that. So $10,000 down, your mortgage is on the property. It's probably like three or $400 a month, even with maybe some maintenance. Maybe it's five. If you have a little maintenance, let's say it's $500 a month and I can rent a six bay out for $250 minimum, probably $300 per, per month. So you're talking about $1,800, 1500 conservatively, and you're, and you're making a thousand dollars a month just by, so self-storage, it's like, it just hit me recently too. I'm like, I'm going through this process. It's very, very lucrative. And like you said, no maintenance or very few minutes, not a lot of maintenance. Right. Right. And then less tenants and you don't have to deal with the tenant laws. I'm dealing with an eviction now that destroyed our cash flow on the other houses. They're going to destroy the house maintenance, everything else. And I have to go through the eviction process here in California to where with them, like, okay, yeah, I'm, all right, you didn't pay this month? Like halfway through the month, I can take all their shit and auction it off. You know what I'm saying? And like, you don't have to be hemorrhaging out cash for the next six months. I'm surprised that you're even able to evict right now in California. That's the thing. Like I didn't oh, even it's know. It's a that. journey. It's, yeah. You have to do some creative things. Yeah. <laughs> to know some people in high places. <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking if I'm driving, listening to the show and 
so you bring up self storage. I'm thinking, hey, are these are you talking about like pods, like the things that are just like placed around people's, I guess, other property, or do you go and rent a bay and like let's talk about the different styles or what specifically you're investing in for or you're looking to invest in for self storage? Is it like a building? Is it like a detached unit? Like what's your what's going to be your lane? So just buildings. Like it's buildings to where right now I have one to where I have three couches in a, in a storage unit. I don't own a truck. I don't feel like asking anybody for a truck. And so I keep paying $150 a month until I decide I want to make that decision. Right. And there's probably, I think like 500 units in there of the same situation of people of big ones, small ones, whatever it is to where people just have all their stuff in there. And it's all it is, is a big facility. It's dedicated to that it's warehouse zoned, that's yeah. broken up, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's zoned industrial and this one's outside and inside and it's all you do. And it's all climate controlled. Like, do you guys have Daryl storage? No, but I was thinking of Mr. Storage is around here. Extra storage is like the green sign. They have that. That looks like extra, look- extra storage like those. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's insane. I mean, the profits are, it's, that is true passivity when, if you do that. So are you talking about, you want to own the building or, or specific units and then rent out the units? No, I'm owning the whole thing. Got it. I'll own the whole thing. And then it, the whole thing operates much more like a business as to like multifamily starts to operate at a business at scale, but mm-hmm. with these single family houses, it's, it, you need to get it scale for it to even make sense. Right. I have a friend who's like, Oh, if you buy four rentals, it'll change your life. And I'm like, bro, what are you talking about? One person stops paying, you're fucked. You know what I'm saying? To where, like, I think at the scale makes it a lot more passive. It's, it's funny. We talked about this when we were going through our, our goals. And we just this, we just had this talk. We we originally started out, we're like, all right, we need 66 units and we're going to have, and we need, you know, it'll generate us X amount of cash flow. And we're like, well, that's a lot of liability. That's a lot of units. And then we're like, all right, let's, let's change this up. We don't need this many units. We just need this amount of cash flow. And then it's like, how can we get there sooner? It's like, well, you just need bigger deals, dude. You need more cash flow. So you got to, you got to scale up. And this is a cool idea with, um, you know, but to me, I'm thinking like, okay, say you have a build a self storage building and there's like 24 units. Like how does that not equate to 24 tenants, right? It's still a person renting it out. So like, can you talk about maybe uh, like how they, you would manage that cycle? So it's not really a, it's a tenant, but you're not dealing with the same tenant nonsense, right? To where like you, they're having marital problems. One of them's moving out. Then you got to deal with that lease, right? Like they're paying you, what is it? $25 to $300 a month to have their shit there. If they want to move their shit, they just call you and be like, Hey, I'm done. I want to terminate my lease. Okay. Have your stuff out by this date. If they quit paying, you just take all their stuff and you go sell it for money to where it, like, it's not, they don't live there. So there, there's no toilets breaking. Yeah. There's no like plumbing it's, issues. Yeah. It's still tenants, but it's not nearly what you two are used to dealing with. Right. Mm-hmm. To where you just have nonsense problems, especially in the properties, the cash flow. you're going to deal with more nonsense. Yep. Yep. Dealing with it tonight. Can you talk about <laughs> um, what a good, deal looks like in this space. I know you're still looking for them right now. Right. But like, just if we could walk through a hypothetical deal to give, to let people like wrap their brain around it a little bit, I think it would be kind of cool. Um, even if you just want to put one together, like I'm just thinking in my head, I'm like, okay, one of these big facilities probably costs like 800 grand or something like that. I don't know how, depending how many units, what would the yeah, walk us through a deal be? that, that makes sense for you that you would look at and like what you look for in a cash flowing, um, uh, deal. It depends, <laughs> but I'd say it's like no, most stuff trade, most stuff trades are like an eight cap. Okay. Right. So most stuff trades in an eight cap and what I'm looking for, right. I don't want to, I target really niche areas to where we're looking at a place in like price, Utah to where there's nothing else for miles. And I'd say it was going to cash flow. It's like $3,000 a month. Like How that is something is? I was, it was like 184 and we were, they wanted, 900,000. We came in at five something. And they said they wanted to be closer to seven. So to you, where they wanted you. So they wanted nine and you said, all right, we'll give you five. And then you kind of trickled back up to the seven. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm in the business of making money, man. Like I can't give you 900,000 at the 900,000. There's like a four cap to where like I personally, if I'm going to go out and raise cash, let's say something bad happens, then what? Like I didn't feel like it gave us enough room. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so I was like, yeah, this is what works for me. You told so them gen- the best deal that would work yeah, for you. Or this is the best deal that would work for me. 
Does that, I mean, and I'm asking this person, like, does that help explain it a little bit more? Yeah, totally. I want to know, I wanted to know basically just the function of how the, how these, you put these deals together. And at, now I understand that an 184 unit in this specific area is, you know, worth $700,000 and it might cash flow at $3,000 a month just to frame it around like, I'm sure there are some economies of scale that this may work in different markets around that same kind of scaled price point. You know what I mean? Like if it's a if it's a 50 unit, maybe you would expect to to cash flow a thousand dollars a month. And it doesn't always work out like that. But I just wanted maybe I think our audience members might say, oh, I, I could see how these properties function. Yeah. And then I'm thinking about like managing these two. And I know we said they're not tenants, but they are tenants in a way. And it's like, I assume at this point, when you have something this big of scale, you just immediately hire a property management company. So you're not dealing with all the paperwork and all this, like 180 units, give or take. That's a lot of paperwork and a lot of things to deal with that, that changes, right? Like people break the lease. Uh, you're just generally everything we look at, we want an onsite manager. So it's almost like it comes with a full-time employee, the deal in itself. Yeah. And then you just evaluate it with that onsite manager in there. And that'll, for me, that makes my life a lot easier. Like I don't want to, I don't want to be out there. Right. And like, I'm, if I'm going to buy this thing in BFE, it'd be smarter for me to have an onsite manager who can, who's experienced with it. And a lot of these facilities will come with them right to where they've been using an onsite manager. And so, okay, yeah, you still want to do this. What are you getting paid? Maybe they get free rent on like a house that's close to the facility or something like that. That's awesome. Cool. That's really cool. I was, I was going to say, I assume you run it in with the numbers anyways, that, yeah, that what you're paying them. So. Yeah. So you don't have to deal with, even though there's limited maintenance or, or tenants, but you don't want to be the one dealing with that. You just told us before the show that you're going to be the thinker. You're going to be the one who's strategizing to go buy the next. And, and I think that's, that's cool to remove yourself from that. So um, you talked about your future goals a little bit, like what's, what's your, not just your portfolio, but what's your wholesale business doing right now, along with some other businesses that you have? I'm curious, like what, what is your, what's your end goal with everything? Like, yeah. where do you see your, I, this is an easy question, but it's kind of strange to think about like three to five years, like where do you want to be with your investments and, and your like wholesale business? Wholesale business. I mean, I'm, it's not my focus. Like I, I don't think about growing it anymore. At this point, if I can get it and it's bringing me, let's say 50 K to hundred K a month. And it's actual, actually passive with the systems I've set up. Cool. Like there we go. But it's not something I'm actively focused on and like actively trying to grow it. I'd say for our call center to call in three years, we wanted to be at $6 million in revenue. Right. So that was one thing. And then run a portfolio wise. I want to buy two facilities this year for self storage. And that's, I haven't thought about where I want to go five year wise with that stuff. That's cool. I think a, an interesting thing to talk about is um, I, I think what probably jumped out to a lot of people in the beginning was when you talked NFL, right. And you were, and you were close with the Seahawks and you have a lot of friends from playing in school, right? Like you have a lot of friends in the league or that are making big dough. And, you know, I've, I've heard a couple of interviews you've done and you essentially lend a hand to your buddies, right? Like if they have questions regarding finances or, Hey, like I've been offered X, Y, Z business deal. Like, what do you think strat? Can you talk to that? And just like kind of what role you play? Um, man, I just have, I'll just be like, Hey man, go to my calendar, book a time. Me and you are going to talk for an hour a week until you feel comfortable being able to evaluate something. And so we'll go through all the basics of real estate, right? Cause like, Oh, I need to get into real estate. I'm need to, I'm going to make a lot of money in real estate to where I'm honestly like, bro, what you need to only thing you need to be investing in is honestly your brand. Cause that, like we were talking about before, you're going to make a lot of money off your brand and then you need to be watching more film. And then if anything, you shouldn't be doing anything active business wise yet until you at least get to your second contract. Got it. Yep. Right. Because Everyone like talks about the second contract. That's like the what? biggest thing. And it's, it's so true. So you come in as a rookie, you're making now, this is no money to sniff at because I don't make this money, but I'm just saying like with the lifestyle that a lot of these guys live, you come into your rookie contract, you're making $3 million a year. That's great. It's awesome. But if that gets shut off after four years and you don't know anything else besides the league that you're in, it can go quick. Right. So you get to that second contract, you make 10, 12, 15 million a year, whatever that's high potentially for the mm -hmm. NFL, for the NBA. It's not really, but it's very cool that you're like a resource to, obviously there's some of your friends, but it's just cool that 
book an hour and, and they come to you. Yeah. They come to you. That's very cool. Yeah. I mean, that is pretty cool. But then my friend plays for the Cowboys and he didn't even have a CPA this year. So he's on turbo tax trying to do stuff. I was that's like, what insane dude, bro. That's fucking insane. I was like, bro, what are you doing? What do you mean? You don't have a CPA. I was like, all right. And connecting with my CPA life insurance, Roth IRA. Like, all right, bro, we got, we got to get your fucking money moving for one. And then he ended up only taking home, I'd say two fifty, right? And so you're you're not making that much money, bro. Like you think these NFL players are making tons of money? Like, like practice squad guy? No, you oh. from active. You're making seven hundred thousand to six something after the taxes that they tax you with. And if you're paying your own fucking taxes, you don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Sure, right? Good point. Yeah, you're gonna you're not gonna take home that much, and then then we need to start talking about, okay, how can I buy some real estate to get some depreciation? Cause they're a W2 employee and shit like that. But like, we love depreciation over here. It's great. Oh yeah. It's great. Like it's great. Yeah. But then like yeah. you still go into the conversation of like, you want to be bankable, right? At least as an entrepreneur to where I will write off everything. And then a bank will be like, well, how much money do you make? Well, I made this much money last year, but like it doesn't show, you know what I'm saying? To where I have friends who are just like, no, I just, I just take the tax every year so I can, do bigger deals. Got it. Very, very cool. cool. That's good advice. Yeah. I think, um, it's really cool to just play in the different avenues. And this episode has been a little bit different because we don't, a lot of times we talk about buy and hold, we talk about just financial independence in general, but you're just finding different ways to play off your original real estate background when you came out of school. So it, it's really cool. It's just really cool. He's an entrepreneur and a hustler. I like, I, you said, you don't, you don't, take shit or F F whatever. Like, I just think it's, it's cool that it plays to your, uh, to who you are and you not only taken your business and started it, but you've taken it to new heights, right. And you jumped into different things. And I think you're going to continue to do the same thing. So it's really cool. We're at the segment of the show. It's called the core four. And th- these are four questions that essentially allow us to get to know you a little bit better. Um, and let listeners get to know you. Um, we'll start it off super easy, but what's your favorite business investing or real estate book um, that you'd recommend to people that are looking to get in the game and maybe branch off from their W2 and go the entrepreneurship right route? Think and grow rich. Does that count as a business book for you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Think well, and grow yeah. rich. Oh yeah. That's my, I think it's the Bible. <laughs> like it is, it. it's changed my life. It's 100% changed my life. Awesome. Love it. What's been your biggest mistake that you've made in your investing career? real estate career that you, uh, you know, and how have you learned from it? Biggest mistake. Um, what's it called? So I guess my biggest mistake ended up being one of my biggest assets. Now, right. When COVID hit, I fired eight cold callers because I panicked and I was like, Oh man, the fucking world's falling. And then eventually from there, I somehow built out a call center. So I'd say, but that slowed down my wholesale marketing to where I have friends who stayed in and like doubled down and they made significant amounts of cash from being the only ones in that market. Right. So that Cause everyone flees. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Third question. Third question. This one is to thinker. So who is your who for 2021? And essentially by meeting this person, you feel that your business or life will be taken to an exponential level. And if you can't think of anyone that you're hoping to meet, who's someone that in your life that you've met that has impacted your business and has taken it to new heights? Um, I'll answer both. Cause I, I'm going to go see Ed Milet talk ah, cool. in at the end of May and like meeting Ed Milet would be pretty dope. I think he's awesome. Yeah. And then, to, Oh, Steve Rosen, Steve Rosenberg say that somebody else said to Ed my last, we've had somebody else mention him on the show. I, I listened to his episode on bigger pockets, but, uh, yeah, very cool. Bro, go listen to his, like, go listen to his podcast with the beginning podcast. Those things are powerful. Like if it's just Ed my talking powerful, like it, I love it. Cool. Who's, uh, maybe who has helped you? You said you were going to answer both. Who's helped you get to where you are and uh, who's your who from the past? My business coach who I paid this has completely changed my thought processes, the, my business trajectories, really everything. And what is it? Last four months I've, my income has skyrocketed and just like the way you think about things to where someone who's at, I want to say like nine levels ahead of me 
to where every question I ask him, he makes me feel like it's a Mickey Mouse ass question. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he's just like, well, I don't know, let's do it like this. And then he talks me through it. And then it's like a mental barrier is being broken. I love that you said that because I think people are very scared to pay for coaches and right. Every single day we talk to more people that have a coach and every, not one person has said to us, yeah, that didn't work out. And maybe some coaches don't work out. Right. But the, the money that you pay comes tenfold. So it's very, uh, it's very cool that you said that. And before I know it, we're going to have a business. Where do you find a business coach like that? Like, obviously it's changed your life, right? But you, if you're going to fork up some dough, you're going to be researching probably over and over to find the right person for you. Um, so when I was working for the other guy, he was in his mastermind. And so I met him and when he flew out here and then I just stayed in touch and I was talking to him and I was running into some business issues to where I was like, bro, I don't, I was like, bro, I'm at 60, like 50, 60 employees. What the fuck do I do here? Like, I was like, how do I structure these things? Like I have processes and everything else to where most wholesalers, like it's like a three man show, right. To where like, you aren't worried about building like a lasting culture. You aren't worried about core values. You aren't worried about all these things, employee attend uh, retention, all these separate things and like growth and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, who's the most, who do I know? Who is a really, really successful businessman who like actually, and I wanted to join his mastermind and he sunned me. He was like, bro, you ain't ready for my mastermind. <laughs> He was like, you ain't, you ain't ready for it, bro. Like, he's, he's like, you're not at that level yet. And they, you guys know who Tim Bratz is? Yes. yes. So Tim Bratz is in his mastermind. Like he has some like really, really high level people in there. I was like, but I'll, um, I'll do some one-on-one -on -one stuff with you. And so like, I knew him personally and like, I had been following him and go watch, listen to his podcast, the making of a DM. You two will both really like it. And, and it's, um, it just makes you think really hard about certain things and just business decisions. So I'd been listening to it and I was like, yeah. And like, I knew people in his mastermind. So that was my first overall goal was like get into the mastermind so I could grow more. Cause I'm, I'm all about forking out money just so I can grow my network and do better, make more money. Efficiency. Yeah. I get it. I love it. Cut, cut right through it and, and pay the money that you, so you don't waste time thinking about whether or not you should. It I, takes well, money to make money, man. Yeah. It really does. I mean, Strat, you're just preaching the choir here. Like everyone has told us that, they need, you need a coach cut through the BS and just, it'll help you streamline and scale your business. So I think it's cool that you bring that up again. Um, the, the last question of our core four is more so a personal one. Um, and it's about you, your family, your life. Like, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh man. I've think about, I've been thinking about this one more. Right. And I, as far as like family legacy, I would like my great, great grandkids to still like live on the ranch that we have. And they're like, yeah, our, our grandpa made this and like, it's old money, right? Like you made legitimate old money. It's not just like, okay, yeah, we did. Okay. It's old money to where the family's taking care of that. We can, in, and then we can impact so many more lives, right? If I can impact four generations of people with the nonprofits so we can start with the money, we can donate and do all that good stuff. That's amazing, man. Yep. That's really cool. Actually, <laughs> it's very I think cool. it's like a movie. Honestly, it's just, <laughs> yeah. I'm just when I, whenever I hear old money, I just get excited. It's cool because like, you're like somebody worked their ass off to build this for somebody right? else. And like the fact that you're when you're like, oh, that's old money. You're like, oh, di like, that's he's, he's different got money. Big money. <laughs> <laughs> that is some, that's some crazy shit. Yeah. So um, I actually got two more just like random pop questions here for you. They're not in the core four. Um, can you talk about I keep hearing this word phrase all the time. And I don't know what it is. What is skip tracing? Really? I do. I swear to God. I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> is it that basic? <laughs> about to get I don't know. Here. I don't know what it is. We're cool. We can get sunned. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I'm not going to sun you. Um, so it's when we'll get a property address and let's say, what would be a good app? If you guys get prop stream, you guys can find their phone numbers and you can get their mailing address. That's all skip tracing is. So you're just basically finding out who like owns a, the property in their details. Who owns the property and how to actually get in contact with them. Essentially just acquiring data. Yeah, I probably should hit Google for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, dude. Oh God, thank you for that. Um, I guess the last one for me is just, you've mentioned the mastermind and you talked about just relationships and, and how they've helped push you to new heights and like your trajectory of your business. Like, 
What do you recommend for people that are interested in investing in real estate, but they have not done so yet? And coupling that with masterminds, like do you, how valuable do you see these? Um, so when I left the, my mentor, I went so broke. I had to donate plasma for marketing money. And me and my son were living off of bananas and rice for several months. I took my tax return and I went to a Steve Trang event and bet on myself to learn and like shortcut what I was um, doing. So I could, because I like bet on myself and stuff like that. But like, so the mastermind and the relationships and then investing in yourself and knowing that you can actually do something, I think is something that is very, very powerful that like you have enough faith in yourself that you're going to take this money and you're going to do more with it is a big, big piece of that. That's what I think really is what the big thing is. And then once you, and that's just getting started. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think you should go invest and I get on how to do shit. If you guys know who Michael Zuber is, he's a friend of mine. He has one rental at a time. He's the guy who says buy four houses and you'll be fine. And I think he's full of shit, but like he has a course that a lot of nine to five people go by and it shows them how to do things step by step by step to where I go. And I send my NFL friends, go look at this, just go look at this, go, go evaluate it. And then you're educated. And then you have the confidence to take the step. Right. I started off in the self storage stuff where I didn't have the confidence to make an offer because I didn't know what I was doing. It is a lot easier to do things. If you, if you feel confident in what you are doing, not if you should run around with your head cut off. That's really cool. And I think also with masterminds, like you, you surround yourself with like-minded people or people that are doing what you are striving to do what you want to do. And it's, we often find it's hard to talk to some of our friends about real estate investing, growing and building a business. And it's like just taking that like next step of a life that like certain people do, but most don't. And, you know, I believe that a mastermind will even further us like just get uh, where our real estate or this podcast and our platform on Instagram and just like the weekly juice in general has already opened so many doors for us and allowed us to network and build relationships with a bunch of people like you, you know what I mean? Like we're all, we're striving for the same thing or similar things. And it's just really cool to get to know people like that. And I think I'm advocating for a, a mastermind, even though I'm not in one yet, you know what I mean? Like we want to join one. It's just like finding the right one. And, um, I think it's cool because a lot of people have advocated for it just like you. So. Hell yeah. yeah it is. It's hard to find the right one. I would tell you that. Like it is hard. I'd tell you to take your time and what's it called? Ask as many people about this thing as you possibly can. Like ask as many people about said guru, about what they know. Even if you don't know these people, I'd go like, Hey, are you part of like said mastermind? Yep. Hey, do you get coached by said person? And like, I'd just go on Instagram and spam people out and like try and figure it out. out. Yeah. And cool. that way, again, you feel confident with it. Cool. And you mentioned you went into, I believe it was Steve Trang's mastermind. And I saw that you interviewed him and I, I meant to bring this up right on the show, but this is, I guess we'll wind down the show with this is like, you have a podcast as well. Can you yeah. talk about like, what's the name of your podcast? What do you talk about? And like, who are the people that you interview? So my podcast is the winning move podcast. And I, I mean, it's selfish. I just want to talk to successful people and see how they are successful. Like, what do you think about, what are you doing? Like I, and I'm, it's not really real estate based. Cause I do think 99% of everything we achieve is just up here. And again, real estate is the widget. So like, I want to know like, what are they doing for their daily stuff? How are they balancing their family? Cause family is really big for me. Like what are just, what are their day-to-day lives? Like what are their habits? What got them to where they were stuff like that. Okay. Awesome. It's great. The last segment of our show is called the, the last drop. And the question here is what advice would you give your younger self strat? If you could go back and maybe talk to, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 year old self. I talked to my girlfriend about this last time I got asked this and she's like, why didn't you say, I said something else, but the number one thing I tell myself is you're more than an athlete to where all of my value was placed in being a football player to where I felt like I had no life skills, got super depressed coming out of college, snapped my ankle in high school and got majorly depressed, right? To where I've achieved a lot more now than I really ever would have in the, in athletics that being realistic with myself of where my athletic ability was. That's first of all, it's, it's humbling. And uh, something that you said earlier in the beginning, in the beginning of the episode where you, you put all your eggs into, into a basket and then you get to this, lead to the league. And then for you to realize that this somebody 
I forget the name of the guy you mentioned, 6'3", 230, and you're like, I'm I'm not as good as him. I have to figure this out. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start over this guy. Like, there's no way. So for like there may be somebody who's too headstrong and just plows through, and then they don't have that plan B. They don't create the life skills, they don't figure out new business ventures. And unfortunately, that's probably a reason why a lot of athletes maybe end up going broke. So it's uh it's cool to have that humility. And I like the story about being more than an athlete because clearly it's pretty evident that you are. Thanks, Ross. Cool. Yeah. So Strat, this has been awesome getting to know you. Thanks for just kind of walking us through wholesaling, call centers, VAs, like a lot of different things in the episode. Um, I'm sure people are going to hit us up and say, Hey, that was a great episode. Strat's the man. We want to get to know him a little bit network. How can people find you maybe on social? Um, what's the best uh, contact we should give them? Uh, best way to reach me is strat daddy on Instagram. Two T's, two Y's. That's probably the best way to reach me. Perfect. We'll make sure to, uh, to link that so everybody can find you. And, um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and you've, you've motivated us. I think we're going to start thinking about wholesaling a little bit, um, and see how we can weave it into our investing. You guys are going to crush it. Oh, we love it. You guys Thanks, are going to fucking crush it. Thank Appreciate you. it.